Hello, my name is Michael Beek. I'm a senior here in the University of Michigan College of Engineering. I'm majoring in Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering, and I'm also obtaining a minor in Multidisciplinary Design. And this is my Senior Honors Capstone Project presentation. So, my capstone project is entitled Emergent Design Failure, Lurking Dangers of Regression-Based Design. I conducted this project this past semester in the winter of 2021, and my capstone advisor was Professor David Singer from the name department. This is a picture of the subject of my design capstone, which is the MV Sisukas. More on that in a moment. The goal of this project was to learn more about and understand emergent design failure by evaluating my experience with NA470. Every student in Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering designs a cargo ship during their senior year. That is our NA470 course, our solo design capstone. And so the goal of this project was to evaluate my own experience with NA470, which resulted in the design of the MV Sisukas seen on the previous slide and to evaluate where there had been issues in the process that I had followed in my experience and combine that with learning more about design theory to attempt to identify and trace back the path that I had followed and identify where there had been issues in the design. First, a little bit about emergent design failure. Emergent design failure is a part of design theory where it views design as a path where you progress from the beginning of the design to eventually the end stages where you have the completed design. And during that process, the design becomes more defined as time goes along and less flexible. As decisions are made, fewer options remain available. And through this process, it is possible to reach a situation where something is wrong with the design and the flexibility to fix what is wrong is either unavailable or it becomes very infeasible and difficult to fix the problems that have arisen as a result of previous decisions that were made earlier in the process. For example, in my 470 experience, I experienced rework where my ship's width had to be changed several times along with weights having to be redistributed for stability and i experienced design churn which is where a lot of excessive readjusting of a aspect of the design has to occur because it's just not working out the way that the situation is i had to redo the design of my midship structural cross section many times and it took much longer than would normally be expected and after evaluating this list of issues i decided to focus on the midship structural cross section for this project so in ship design the midship structural cross section is an analysis of the cross section of the ship if you were to look down along the ship's length and design has to go into the internal structure that prevents the ship from breaking as it's floating or traveling in the water. Midship, which is midway down the length of the ship between the bow and the stern, is theoretically about the location of where the greatest bending moments are going to be applied along the length of the ship. So midship is where there are regulatory requirements that we have to evaluate the structural cross sections design at this point in the ship's length. And it has to meet requirements set to resist the bending moments and also the tendency of plates at the extreme top and the extreme bottom of the ship to resist buckling when they're subject to large bending moments. And these are requirements that are set by the American Bureau of Shipping. 
and there are structural calculations that have to be carried out in order to make sure that the cross-section meets those requirements. And these are set based on the size and the length and the weight of the ship. The Sisukas had an issue where it turns out the height of the overall structure of the ship's hull was taller than would normally appear in a ship of this size. And while that made satisfying the overall requirement for resisting bending moments based on the cross-sections moment of inertia, it made that quite easy. It made it very difficult to meet the requirements on the deck and the bottom plates to resist buckling due to the high lever arm between the extreme top and extreme bottom and the centroid of the area of the cross section. So once it was determined that the high height of the structure was the culprit, uh, we moved on to attempting to determine why the Sisukas's height was so large compared to other vessels. So at the very beginning of the NA-470 project, the vessel's size was initially estimated using regression analyses based on a provided database that had information on many existing container ships. And every student in NA-470 is given this same database and does this same process of doing regression analyses. For the vertical dimension of the ship, a regression analysis was carried out based on draft, which is the distance between the bottom of the ship and the waterline, denoted by T on this diagram here, not the depth, which is the total distance, but from the bottom of the ship to the top of the hull denoted by D. Now this was revealed that it was because the original database of information which was provided at the beginning of NA-470 includes the draft of all the ships in the database, but there is no information on the depth of the ships in the database. As well, the NA-470 project guidelines which we follow and to guide us through the design project do not include any assessment of depth. Furthermore, once the regression was carried out based on the draft and it resulted in a hull design which allowed for stacks of eight cargo containers high within the ship's cargo hold, this was not changed any further as the project went on as it did not cause any issues until it was time to evaluate the ship's structural cross-section towards the very end of the design project. So here, as a part of this honors capstone project, I went back to the original database of ship information and researching some regulatory requirements which govern freeboard which is the distance from the waterline of a ship to its main deck, I was able to estimate the freeboard of all the ships in the database based on their size, combine that with their listed draft, and obtain an estimate of the depth of every ship in the database. And I performed another regression analysis on that information in the same way that draft had originally be used, been used at the beginning of the NA-470 project. Here is a comparison of the original regression based on draft, based on the cargo capacity of the ship on the left, and the new regression based on the estimated depth information instead of draft on the right. On the left, you can see that red dot is the draft value of the Sisukas. For the regression based on draft, the Sisukas is right in the information of all the other ships. It's not outlying. It seems to be fine. But the additional regression that was based on overall depth on the right reveals that the Sisukas's depth is massively outside the bounds of all the data on all the existing ships. Now, this very high depth resulted in 
a lot of difficulty satisfying not the overall area moment to resist bending required by the ABS regulations, but it made it very difficult to satisfy the deck section modulus requirement, which is based on the overall area moment of inertia, but also the distance between the deck plating and the centroid of the cross section. This means that essentially there was a very high lever arm between the centroid and the deck, which means that if the ship was subject to bending, it might be able to overall resist the bending moment applied to it, but there was a very high danger of the deck plates buckling under the stress that was applied to them. And this was due to that very large lever arm between the centroid and the deck, which was due to the very high depth of the overall structure. While it was possible to eventually reach a design of the cross section, which did satisfy all the regulatory requirements and was used in the final design of the Sisukas, it was quite difficult to arrive at this final design and it took many iterations and adjustments of the cross section design to meet the requirements. So in conclusion, regression analysis is very powerful as a design tool, but it is very difficult to use correctly. And there's many pitfalls involved when there are many complex and combining factors involved in your analysis. And emergent design failure at such an early phase of design, in this case, an issue which was introduced on day one of the project can simply lurk without causing any apparent issues until a much later part of design, at which point it is very difficult or impossible to make adjustments to fix the original issue. And it can be very difficult to adjust later parts of the design to fit the situation which has been created. This concludes my presentation for my honors capstone design project, and I would like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video.